Good morning, um, everyone online. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the Center on the United States uh, and Europe at the Brookings Institution, whose director I am. My name is Constanze Stelzenmüller. Uh, and we, you are joining us for a webinar of one hour on Poland's election and the direction of democracy in Central Europe. Um, with me, I have four um, splendid experts on these issues. Anna Jamal Bosse, who um, is a non-resident fellow at Brookings, but teaches at Stanford University and is the author um, of uh, a series of, of remarkable books, including on the role of the church in early modern Europe. Um, I have with me uh, Daniel Fried, Weiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council and a former US ambassador to Poland. Uh, there can be no discussion on Poland and the United States of America without Dan Fried in it. Um, then we have Adam Tracik, who is joining us from Warsaw. Dan Fried is joining us from Washington and Anna from California. Adam is the, the director of More in Common Poland. And when it's his turn, I will ask him to explain what more in common is. And finally, Milan Nietzsche, a senior research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations, but a Slovak national who will be helping us understand what is going on in Poland's neighboring country of Slovakia, which also recently had elections and is about to form a right-wing government. And as uh, those of you who are obsessive watchers of Europe, and of course, who wouldn't be, um, know, since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Poland has been a key player in Western efforts to support Kyiv's resistance. But years of democratic backsliding under governments led by the right-wing populist Law and Justice Party, also known as PiS, growing tensions with the European Union and a recent spat with Ukraine over agricultural imports complicate Warsaw's role. And with rising influence on the continent and the potential to become a major power in Europe, or arguably it already is, Poland's elections on this Sunday, October 15th, um, in which peace is challenged by the, by the return to domestic politics of former European Council President Donald Tusk and the emergence of the right-wing Confederacja Party could be consequential, not just for the future of democracy in Poland, but for the future of European politics and the Euro Security Atlantic, secu the Euro Atlantic Security Order, sorry, and of course our support for Ukraine. In the hour that we have, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to uh, address a different aspect of the of, of this election, and I will leave at the end about 15 questions, 15 minutes for questions online which will be emailed to me and which I will hopefully be able to read. And we will end at 12 sharp. Let me start, Anna, with you. Um, we're really grateful to have you on. It's still quite early in, in California. Um, thank you for making the time for us. Um, what I would like you to do, you just wrote a great piece for us called um, What is at Stake in Poland's Election? You would find that on the Brookings website for anybody who is interested in the details. Do us um, a favor, if you would, um, and start us off by setting the scene here. What is at stake in these elections on Sunday? Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, now, as many of you know, the elections are going to take place on Sunday, October 15th. And what's really at stake here is whether the current incumbent, the Law and Justice Party, a conservative populist party, will continue various controversial policies. Um, peace has been in power since 2015. It's charged with several incidents of democratic erosion. Um, it's attempted to, and it has transformed the judicial system. It's attacked uh, free media, and it's perpetuated societal division between its loyalists and the worst sort of polls, those who don't support it. Um, the current elections are very closely fought. The main opposition party is the civic coalition. It's come out with numerous proposals. It's campaigning all over Poland. Um, there are other parties that are involved, and currently peace, as Adam Otelis, is polling around 36-39%. The civic coalition, its rival, is a little bit behind. This election is going to be all about turnout and who can really mobilize the voters. 
And what's at stake here basically are sort of several, it's not just the future of democracy in Poland, but more broadly relations within Europe. So first, um, I think if peace is reelected, it's likely to be reelected in a coalition with most probably Confederacja, a party espousing both libertarianisms and xenophobia. Um, it's not clear whether that party will act as any kind of a constraint on peace. And so what we're likely to see if peace is reelected is a further erosion of democracy. Um, now with new charges of corruption, most recently the selling of Schengen visas en masse, um, we will also see a further sort of worsening of relations with Germany and the EU, mostly because peace conducts foreign policy largely for domestic consumption. It's driven by signaling to its loyal constituency rather by some kind of a long-term long sort of vision or a long-term sort of proposals for the future of Polish foreign policy. And that also means that if peace is reelected, Poland is not likely to be a serious player in European politics. It's going to be a spoiler. Um, whoever is in the next Polish government needs to build alliances and coalitions, persuade would-be partners, but what we're likely to see from peace is more calling out um, and alienating potential allies. So both domestic politics and EU politics are very much at stake here. Thank you, Anna. Um, that's a depressing prospect. Um, can you explain to me perhaps um, would would anything change significantly if uh, the opposition won? I think if the opposition wins, we will see attempts to sort of rebuild democracy in Poland. And I think we would better we would definitely see um, a better set of relations with the European Union and with Germany. Sorry, I, I, I of course misstated my question. That 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 is obvious from how the opposition has been campaigning, and uh, I, I think from from its uh, from its entire program. What I meant was, um, do you are you worried that there might be, given that the that the Polish society appears to be more polarized, and Adam will will shortly tell us more about that. Are are you concerned that um, a if if peace lost the election, that it might challenge the outcome? I don't think so. There's never been any questioning of the electoral process um, in Poland. Peace has attempted to gerrymander those. Mm -hmm. Attempts were defeated. Mm -hmm. um, it forces, for example, you know, there's some electoral manipulation. Um, all the, for example, expat votes are going to be counted in Warsaw, which basically dilutes any power of you know the 700,000 people who will be voting. But they will not call. I don't think they will call the um, results of the election to question. That's not how peace operates. And I don't think you know this is a system that they very much participated in and built up. We're not going to see a Trump-style renunciation of the elections. Okay, well, that's that's great. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, that was very helpful scene setting. I'm going to move to you, Adam. Now, Adam Traczek, the director of More in Common Poland. Perhaps tell us quickly what More in Common is and what it does, and and then explain to us uh, your the the tell us a little bit about the results of your recent survey of uh, Polish voter attitudes. Yes, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, More in Common is a nonprofit uh, which is working on strengthening democracy uh, and uh, and reducing polarization, political po polarization in, in the five different countries. Poland is the fifth one uh, that, that joins the, the the bunch to uh, basically to carry out a fight against uh, polarization. Uh, the current election is, uh, from our perspective, indeed very very interesting because polarization is at the core. Uh, of the debates, uh, we see that the Polish, um, that the general perception of Polish politics is that it is very, very polarized. That you actually have two uh, opposing camps fighting each other in a in a fight uh, between good and evil, uh, and there are no nothing in between. Uh, we actually now we study, which was published uh, this morning in in in, 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 in Poland's time, um, we see that uh, that the actual image of the Polish population uh, is much more diverse. Uh, we have. Uh, we have identified seven segments, uh, and they, of course, differ in, in, in size and differ in ideology, uh, in, in their attitudes towards politics, in the way how, how they react to certain, certain political events. Um, so uh, we do see that, uh, that uh, the overall question of, um, of in, in this election will be indeed how people react, how these different segments uh, react to, uh, to this very polarizing campaign. Uh, this, the big question is, of course, uh, the turnout uh, will people reject 
uh, the the polarizing campaign, the style, the very polarizing style of this um, of this campaign. Uh, and if they do reject it, which means they how do they how do they do it? Uh, will they vote for the smaller parties, or would they say simply say, well, politics is too dirty at the moment, and we're going to stay at home. We're going to um, to basically stay out of this uh, of this conflict, or are we going to? Uh, as I said, vote for one of the smaller parties and basically telling the two big players, and especially the uh, the governing, the ruling law and justice party, enough is enough. We want a different kind of uh, politics. This will be a big, uh, big question. Uh, given looking at our data, we see a huge, uh, huge, the, the huge majority of polls is exhausted, basically. Uh, but the question how they react to it is still is still open. And I mean, if you look at the public opinion polls, which was already uh, mentioned, uh, the Peace Party is polling at around 35-36%, uh, the Civic Coalition at around 30%, uh, the three smaller parties around 10%. Uh, so which basically means that uh, that at the moment the election seems to be really balanced on the, on, on the razor's edge uh, with every scenario possible. Uh, I'm not, therefore, I'm not going to make any any predictions. I think it's um, it's um, it's simply too complicated. And if anyone is presenting any any predictions, if anyone says, well, I'm sure about the outcome of the election. It's basically not true. Uh, we can discuss scenarios, uh, but I mean, it will be a very, very close uh, election, uh, totally different to the last election in 2019, where the only question was, well, will the Law and Justice Party, uh, how big will, will the win be uh, of the Law and Justice Party? This time, it's really, uh, it's really uh, unclear, it's super close, uh, and we're going to probably wait until the very, very end, very last vote, uh, to be counted to see what um, uh, what the what the final result will be, uh, because even small shifts in each of the of the many districts uh, in all over Poland would have a tremendous effect on the overall re result uh, and the distribution of seats in, in the Polish Parliament. Fascinating, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, I understand that the study of yours is currently published in Polish only, um, but you will be publishing it in English. Yes, we will be publishing an executive summary after the the election, uh, because our our study deals not only with this election but with general divides uh, in in the Polish society. Great. And let me ask you something else. Can you say a little bit more about these divides in terms of of location, urban versus regional? That seems to be one of the classic, at least cliche ideas that one that one has about the Polish electorate, and the and the other cliche, of course. Is is that younger people tend to be more leaning more liberal progressive and older older more rural voters lean more conservative. Is that even correct? Well, to some extent, it is correct. Of course, uh, there are always uh, at, the, at the same time that this is correct, and of course, it is at the same time a little bit simplified. Of course, uh, it's uh, the Polish uh, society is it's much more complicated than. Uh, than, uh, than, than binary divides would, uh, would suggest, of course, as any other uh, society. Uh, we have looked at moral foundations, we have looked at deep beliefs, we have looked at political behavior uh, to, to analyze the different, uh, different divisions within the Polish, uh, Polish society. So we have looked at ideology. Uh, demographics wasn't so, so important uh, for us, but of course, uh, there are certain demographics uh, characteristics that you can prescribe to uh, to each and every segment. And, and in general, it is fair to say that big cities vote for liberal uh, politicians. Uh, rural areas tend to vote more conservative. Uh, smaller cities as well tend to vote um, more, more conservative. And of course, the big question is uh, how will uh, first-time voters react, uh, how, how they will uh, vote, uh, because they, as you said uh, correctly, they are uh, more liberal than, uh, than an average poll. Uh, but at the same time, they not, they're not as politically active uh, as an average poll. Uh, and especially among young women, which would, would normally uh, think, well, there are a lot of reasons to, for young women to, to go and vote uh, because of the, uh, of the abortion ban, for example, because constant attacks on, on, on women's rights uh, in, in, in Poland. Uh, but at the same time, we, see, we do see that especially young women uh, are very disoriented politically in a, in a way. Uh, they haven't found their political home yet. Many of them are still thinking about, well, should they vote? And if they do vote, which party should they vote for? They, of course, are not going to vote for, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the ruling law and justice party. Uh, but I mean, also the distribution of their votes within the opposition camp, within the democratic opposition camp. And of course, the turnout among young, especially young women uh, could be crucial, could, could prove crucial uh, for the for the final result, 
So in recent weeks, we have seen a lot of mobilization campaigns targeted exactly at young, uh, young women in order to well, ma make sure that they, that they do vote and they do vote um, for, for the opposition. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I am actually now going to move to Milan first to con to complete the the sort of the regional scenario here, because uh, Milan, as I was saying earlier, currently works at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, but is a Slovak and has been very closely following recent elect elections in his own country. Um, and um, as, as uh, Ambassador Fried was saying when we were chatting earlier, has accurately predicted their outcome. Milan, do you want to fill us in on where we are? Well, in Bratislava, you have a um, coalition agreement in principle signed between Robert Fico's uh, Smell Social Democracy, the mod then the moderate Social Democratic Last Party, Smil Splinters from Fico, and the uh, hard nationalist uh, Slovak National Party. They will have a slim but functioning uh, majority of three votes in a 150 seat parliament. Uh, they still have to formalize the agreement, but uh, within a quite short time limit uh, to form a government from President Chaputova, Robert Fico managed to pull it out. What is important for Slovaks is also the outcome from Poland on Sunday, because I think that will determine the room to man for maneuver to Robert Fico on the EU level and in region. This could be a very critical year for Central Europe, for Central European politics, as 2015 was. If you remember, 2015 was not only a year of migration crisis, huge migration crisis in Europe, but also, it was also a year when power in Poland changed hands. Both at level of government and level of president, it went all of a sudden to peace. And this enabled a populist Central Europe or the Visegrad group to emerge on the Europe, in European politics for the first time. And I see something similar happening with however many caveats and differences because the world has changed and also the region has changed. But I think the outcome um, of, from Poland is now again determining how far will region go and how far I think you can have this bounce back of populism, because I mean, you can say, if peace is reelected, why does it matter? I think it matters more than before, because not only because they have chosen their path to stay in power, uh, if they I mean, was a conscious decision to go anti-German and anti-Ukrainian in the last uh, parts of the campaign, this will have repercussions. And also because uh, in the region, you now have only Czech Republic actually in the moderate sort of pro-European camp. The three, Viktor Orban and Poland was working on the peace quite well. And you have the third player. Uh, Slovakia is in the Eurozone. I think Robert Fico as prime minister will be more pragmatic and rather avoiding a clash with Brussels. But you have already um, many, many difficulties between Brussels, European Union and Poland. Um, that the, uh, the 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 peace government and under under Morawiecki and Kaczynski actually they they were trapped they don't know how to move out of it I see that they will simply move out they will be comfortably moving Poland out to the to the margins of of European Union politics and pulling the region with them if they if they if they win if they retain power on the contrary if it's a stalemate or if it's Tusk I think this will change the region. This will actually um, really cut the regional base of Viktor Orban. And I leave it at that. If you want, I can tell something more about Bratislava. And also some interesting comparisons I see between the two elections and two campaigns, including turnout was crucial in Slovak election. Well, actually, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, is there, I mean, surely there are, I mean, you've already made it clear that you think Pizzo is more pragmatic right, uh, than, than the, the, the peace team is. Um, what, what, what are the, 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 the similarities and dissimilarities that you observe that we should be paying attention to? Well, starting with the elections itself and campaign, turnout in Slovakia was, and these were elections that, uh, parliamentary elections that were taking place only two weeks ago. So turnout was highest in 20 years. 
It was higher in Slovakia than after murder of Jan Kuciak, investigative journalist, and his, his fiance, where there were mass protests. Mm. This time it was still a few per percentages higher, which to me is a message that not only the anti fico camp, but also fico camp managed to mobilize their voters. And mm. he used tactics similar to PiS and Kaczynski, cultural issues, basically telling the traditional part of society, you are now threatened because the other side wants to impose uh, same-sex marriages and, um, I don't know, climate issues. And also he very ably sort of explore different sentiments on the war in Ukraine. He doesn't care that much about war in Ukraine. He's not that pro-Russian as described. He wants to get back to power and stop actually police investigations into corruption and his people. Um, and once I mentioned this, I think the real challenge and difference between Poland and Slovakia is I'm not so worried about Slovak about democracy in Slovakia. Robert Fico won 23%, um, and he will be relatively weaker than Orban or, or, or than, than peace was. But I'm worried about rule of law in Slovakia and also support for Ukraine. Uh, other important difference, I think, is I, I have quickly two more. There was no Tusk on the side of the opposition. The outcome from Slovak elections were not the worst. The opposition could pull out also, I mean, they, they could form a government, they had majority with Pellegrini the moderate social democrat, but they were weak and they were slow. They didn't have Tusk, they didn't have somebody experienced who could actually rival Fico's moves and they were outmaneuvered. And my third comparison is about what happened with the ultra-right vote. If you if you will, with many differences, uh, Confederacja in Poland. Fico's last stages of campaign aimed at that voters and he managed to push them down from 10% in polling below 5%. They are not in parliament. And he, he actually attracted his their voters, which enabled him now to actually form the government because in the end, the outcome was about small parties. Mm. And who is possible coalition partner for FITSA? And Thank ultra right was not. So I think by, and he managed to do it. So I think for Confederacja, which is crucial piece, I think in Polish sort of constellation, when Kaczynski aimed at that, I'm I'm sort of seeing similar tactique. All right. Thank you very much, Milan. Um, that was very, very helpful um, contextualization of uh, what we are going to be looking at on Sunday in Poland. Um, let me move with that to Dan Fried, Ambassador Fried, uh, an old friend um, who has spent much of his professional life at the State Department worrying about uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I think probably has the phone number of every politician and policymaker in Central Eastern Europe on speed dial, and was of course ambassador in Warsaw. Um, I'm wondering, could you from your personal experience uh, tell us, was this, this the polarization of Polish society and this, this seeming gridlock between a sort of an ethno-nationalist inward looking, right and a uh, sort of liberal a liberal cosmopolitan poland that that nonetheless you know at least in the past has has not seemed particularly good at at the business of politics was was that predictable and what does it mean what does it mean now for transatlantic relations Let's cut the Poles and the Central Europeans some slack here. The political tensions that have been described so far have their counterparts in Western Europe and the United States. So I don't believe in singularizing these countries. The good news is that we're all part of the same political civilization, you might say. The bad news is that we share the same pathologies. I will also say to the credit of the Central and East Europeans, they have undergone in the last generation a massive, intense transformation. What Western Europe did in three generations, the Central and East Europeans have done in one generation. And that's, that's stressful. The Poles have a tradition of linking their national values and their national Polish cause to universal values. That goes back to the 18th century. And it accounts for many of the best elements in Polish political history. Well, there are a lot of Poles who are discomforted by 
the rapid modernization of polar society and the rapid secularization of polar society, which mirrors what happens in Western Europe. So you were going to get some kind of a reaction. You also have part of the intensity and the, the animosity in Polish politics is due to the fact that these people all know each other. The um, Tusk is old enough to have been a younger member of the Solidarity, a sort of second rank younger leadership in the late 1980s and 1989. That's when I met him um, in, the, in the early 90s. They all know each other. And these feuds go back to, you know, they go back 30 years and they are in, in, intensely felt. Um, none of which answers your question specifically, but it, you know, I'm trying it's to give useful, you It's useful historical context. Right. Fair enough. And th okay. Then the, you asked also about the foreign policy implications, the kind of the strategic implications. Um, the Law and Justice Party, unlike Fico and certainly unlike Orban, has been a staunch supporter of Ukraine and an opponent of um, Putin's Russia. Moreover, they are supported in this by the liberal opposition. Um, as the liberal opposition didn't run its campaign of saying that our opponents are right on Ukraine, but in fact, there is a consensus with the exception of the Confederacia Party that Putin represents a threat, that Ukraine is um, worthy of Polish support. And at the beginning of the war, Polish society was overwhelmingly pro-Ukrainian and demonstrated that by taking, literally taking into their homes um, hundreds of thousands of um, Ukrainian refugees. Now- well, Nearly a uh, million. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it was, it was probably a million you know, um, Ukrainian refugees, an astonishing act of basically national solidarity and generosity. And if you ask Poles at the time why they were doing it, and I did, the answer was always the same, because that used to be us, which was a powerful statement of solidarity. Now that the, the Pol Polish support for Ukraine has been stressed by some economic factors, by the fact that it's expensive, and by the, um, the grain the, the issue of Ukrainian grain appearing in Polish markets, depressing prices, alienating Polish farmers. Um, the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, who's not running for re-election, was pretty skillful at damping this down after a kind of 24 or 48-hour um, spike in tensions. So in terms of foreign policy, you're not likely, if peace wins or the liberals win, you're not likely to see a radical departure. However, in relations with Germany and the European Union, there are stark differences. And this is one of the paradoxes of Polish foreign policy under the current government. The Polish government regards Russia as a threat, but a lot of the political ire is directed at Berlin, particularly among in the right, in the, in the right-wing media. This is largely for electoral purposes, but it comes at a tremendous price. Um, Poland was proven right about Russia. And Constance, you know perfectly well that for years, many of the West Europeans were pa patronized the Poles and the, and the Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians for being Russophobic or prisoners of history or some such rot. And it turns out the Poles were right all along. Both I have no recollection of that. No, I'm joking. Of course they were. Uh, they were right and you were right. Well, right. The 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 Poles were right, but instead of recognizing that and then working with Germany to build a common um Russia policy, which is needed, a lot of the political a lot of Polish political capital is being spent in quarrels with the Germans. Um like, likewise with the European Union, which is popular in Poland because Poles get a lot from the European Union and they know it. Um, the fights over the judiciary have also drained away a lot of Polish political capital. So as you said earlier, Constance, and I'll, this is the note I want to wind up on, Poland is poised to play a leading role in Europe's new Russia policy. 
that would be good for the United States, that would be good for Europe, it'd probably be good for Poland also. It wouldn't be good for Vladimir Putin. It would be good okay. for Ukraine. Um, but Dan, that, me... is, that is what's being sacrificed by politics, and I hope that it gets fixed after the election, no matter who wins. All right, let me come come sort of dig deeper on that, but but perhaps two two sort of references and um, in in actually shameless self promotions. But since I've been referencing uh, Anna's and Adam's uh, work, if if you'll forgive me, and I know Milan, you have also written about Slovakia for for uh, the, uh, your current employer DGRP. Uh, we Brookings uh, has the Brookings Foreign Policy and the Economic Studies programs uh, have a so-called Ukraine index, where you can find the current numbers of, among other things, of refugees being hosted in Europe. And I just checked last night, and it is uh, nearly a million for Poland, which is 2.5% of Poland's uh, population. Germany has the, uh, the largest number of Ukrainian refugees in absolute terms, but a much smaller percentage of our 80 million population. Um, and of course, the thing you didn't mention is that the Poles are now uh, well en route um, to spending 3% on defense, whereas we, are, we in Germany are struggling to keep our 2% commitment to NATO. Um, the, the other thing, if anybody uh, should have the morbid interest um, uh, in, in, in German-Polish relations that I, of course, have, uh, my, I've just written a, a column in, in the FT uh, on this topic, which is about to go online, uh, where I actually say many of the things that you've just said, Dan. Um, the, uh, the, the relationship is indeed toxic, um, and one of the most toxic issues is reparations. We won't get into that here. But, um, but it is also true that, that the Poles and other Eastern Europeans, Central Eastern Europeans were right about many things and, and that we brushed them off um, and that we are fundamentally um, ignorant about many of the of many of, of attitudes and concerns uh, east of, of Western European borders. But Dan, what I am curious about is when you say that Poland is poised to be a major actor in European security. That is, of course, something that the peace government itself likes to say, right? It says the, the center of gravity in Poland um, is moving east, uh, in Europe is moving eastwards. And it, it has clearly, you know, been sort of trying to orchestrate an, a lot of minilateral and regional alliances, the Bucharest Nine, the Three Seas Initiatives and others in order to maximize um, its influence in, in the European Union and to presumably also counteract the perceived weight of Western Europe. But, but can you, and, and this is where I actually would like all of you to come in if you have views on this, um, is this actually working? Is it, is, is Poland really becoming, you know, A, is it, is it, is it really seen as a as a leader by by its eastern and central U European neighbors, or are the 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 differences greater than the than 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 peace likes likes to suggest? Firstly, and secondly, what is the vision of Europe that peace has and the opposition has? What 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 exactly is their idea, their grand idea? Of European security, I will. I'm giving this question to Dan, but I would like uh, now that we're sort of in the conversational phase here. Please just raise your hands or butt in, uh, or open your mics if you'd like to. We will go to questions if I get any uh, in about 15 minutes. But but for now, we're among ourselves, and I do want this to be a free flowing conversation, as though we were sitting on a real life panel. So Dan, first over to you. Um, Constance, there's a lot to unpack in what you said. The Poles are not playing the role in Europe that they ought to be playing ver by virtue of their size, strength, and the fact that they were right strategically about Russia. Mm. And that's because <clears throat> they're spending their political capital fighting with Brussels and Berlin. Now, the Hungarians don't, you know, have nothing in common um, with the Polish government with respect to relations with Putin. Um, we'll see how the Slovak government ends up. But some of Poland's neighbors have come to me privately and said, we need Polish leadership because we share the same view about Russia, but the Poles are spending 
so much energy fighting with Germany, they're unable to play a role that they would otherwise be ready to play, which would be good. And th this is what a lot of the Baltics, Baltic um, people in government and out of government have said to me, that they want Poland to play this leadership role, but it is, it can't do both. It can either play a leadership role in Europe and help craft a, a sustainable Russia policy, or it can fight with Berlin and, Brus and Brussels, but it can't do both at the same time. So this is a moment where Poland has potential to stand up, which has been a longstanding, basically Polish dream on both sides of the of Poland's political divide for a long time. And now they have an opportunity, and I hope that after the elections, whoever wins, they'll be able to take advantage of it. Right. Uh, so the, it is it is in the category of missed opportunity, but not completely missed. I was in Berlin recently, and the Germans, German officials all know that Poland was right and they were wrong. Well, not all of them, but m most of them will acknowledge that Poland was right and they were wrong about Russia for a, a long time. But they, it's hard to work with Poland because of Polish, Poland's German bashing, which is getting in the way of Poland's strategy, at least as Poles define it to me. So this is a, this is a contradiction that the next government, no matter what it is, ought to tackle. Right. Okay. Um, well, all I can say as, as a German, um, it seems to me that it would be, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but I believe it to be shared by, by people in my, in my sort of analyst tribe, is, is that it would be a good thing if Europe were a little more balanced, right, by, by a strong Polish and a strong Central Eastern European voice on a number of the issues that you've raised. I'm in violent agreement with you there. But I'd like to bring right. in the others. Um, Anna, do you think that this Polish strategy of sort of mustering alliances and, and casting itself as the natural leader of Central and Eastern Europe is working? No, I don't think it is. I think Poland is getting a lot of attention, but getting attention is not leadership. And you know, its partners, whether in the Bucharest Nine or in the uh, Three Seas Initiative, look at the way it's um, interacting with Germany and the rest of the EU. And I think for Poland to be a serious player, it needs many more, other, many other countries. It, it needs to engage Germany and France on a very different basis. It needs to persuade and build alliances. And above all, it needs to articulate a vision that's something other than we were right or more broadly making Europe safe for Poland again. Because insofar as there's a sort of foreign policy vision, that's what it consists of. So I think for Poland to be a serious player, it needs to do serious work both on basically uh, persuasion and building alliances on the one hand, and on the other hand, articulating a broader vision that's attractive to would-be partners rather than just um, self-serving. Well, but then, then let's let's dig a little deeper here. If I if I if I could ask you to un unpack this, to use the fashionable term, um, the, I mean, we're we're saying we're we're saying Poland all the time, but but surely there are distinctions in the between the thinking of of peace and 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 uh, the civic coalition, um, KO. Um, I'm not even going to attempt the Polish pronunciation. Um, I'm. Delighted that we're on first name basis on this panel. Can I just say that um, the this is one of the, the 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 political hazards of being a German in an enlarged Europe um, is that you are dealing with a lot of hard to pronounce names for the average Teuton. Um, but Anna, to be serious again, um, do do it, it seems to me looking at least at the past years of peace since they came to power in what twenty fifteen. Um, what we've seen is a Poland that uh, is quite nationalist, perhaps for understandable historical reasons, but that is very wary of, um, of attempts, particularly coming from Paris and Berlin, to seek uh, greater European integration and perhaps centralization or a greater um, uh, I mean, the, the word that always comes up in this discussion with Polish, Polish friends and contacts in this context is, is veto, right? 
the the one of the greatest fears in water also appears to be um, the the loss of uh, individual nations' veto power in case there is some kind of move to qualified majority voting, which of course is connected by some in Brussels and in Western European capitals with the the enlargement that we're planning because we are we are intending to give Ukraine a path to membership at the December Council. And we are also we also have the Western Balkans in our sights, right? Um, is that only peace, or is is the is the is the liberal side of Polish politics actually equally concerned with this? You know, Donald Tusk was the president of the European Council, right? mm -hmm. so he knows how the game is played. And I right. think he, even if there's a similar concern with preserving sovereignty, he would at least articulate. Uh, those considerations and those concerns in a much more polit politic way, whereas peace is mostly conducting foreign policy for domestic consumption, and it hasn't been able to articulate a vision that's attractive to other partners as well. Um, as for qualified majority voting, I think this is, you know, the other sort of aspect of this is that in many cases, peace is unwilling to accept trade-offs, right? It simply wants what it wants, and it's very hard for it to accept that it may not get everything it wants, and then basically turns against the European Union and claims that they're attacking our sovereignty because they dare to withhold funds or something like that. Um, so I think there's a sense in which, you know, if the move to qualified majority voting actually goes through, um, if Poland wants to sort of have a voice in that, again, it needs to build alliances, and it's simply not doing that. It's, you know, articulating its concerns and grievances um, under the peace government without giving a, a different vision. Um, I think if under Tusk, given his experience, this would look a bit different. Say, similar concerns could be articulated in a much more politic um, and maybe more, more convincing way. Yeah. Um, does, if anybody wants to come in here, just you know, raise your hands. Yes, Adam. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is really a super important topic, and I think it's very important to stress the, to stress the lack of pragmatism of, of the current government. It's fighting for the sake of uh, fighting. It's picking up fights to be able to create, as Anna said, a certain image for for a domestic audience, uh, which is which is very striking. I think uh, when you when you compare it to other populist or right wing right wing politicians all over Europe, look look at the Italian prime minister. Uh, she's striking compromises. She's negotiating. The Polish government isn't negotiating. It's vetoing, or at least it's saying it's vetoing, even if it's not uh, vetoing. So there is there's simply no strategy behind it. And I mean, look at, uh, at the reparations that you uh, issued that you mentioned. Uh, it's clear for everyone that Germany will not pay. Uh, so what do you want to get instead? What's, what's the strategy behind the claim? Uh, nobody knows. I don't even think that the government knows uh, what, it, uh, what, it, what it wants. Uh, and I mean, should the, should the opposition win the election, um, it will face a unique challenge. It will have to transition or transform a political system from a liberal democracy uh, to, a, to a liberal one. And this is something that has never been done before. Uh, it's, it's not a complete shift it's of, of, of system. It's building a, a ship in an open sea, but within certain democratic, democratic standards, uh, which has been broken uh, or, uh, or at least in, in a way uh, misused, and how do you roll it back without making the same mistakes, without actually breaking the law and breaking uh, rule of law uh, by, by yourself? So, kind of the vision for um, for a European policy, it's not um, it's not the, uh, it's not on the on the top of the agenda uh, for the opposition at the moment. But I think what we can expect definitely uh, will be a simply a simply more pragmatic approach. Uh, maybe also a lack of vision, like a lack of a broader vision but at least be more pragmatic and be able to sit at the table and see from issue to issue how, how can we strike a compromise in a pragmatic pragmatic way. Look at what happened during the, uh, the PR government um, before, uh, before 2015. Look at Eastern Partnership. So Poland was able to mobilize uh, allies uh, for an issue that was important to the government, to what was important to, uh, to its security. It wasn't very spectacular, maybe. It wasn't like a a big breakthrough, but it was a kind of a step-by-step -step approach. And I think this is something that we could expect from the opposition should it uh, win uh, the election and form the next government. Mm -hmm. If I may, Constanza, oh, just very please. briefly, it, it's really sad to see Poland playing under this government, which lost its pragmatic sort of politicians and also uh, people at the foreign ministry. It's really sad to see Poland playing under its weight, not only in the European Union, but also in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, 
if you have a deputy foreign minister whose single issue is reparations of Germany, and who then orders ambassadors to other Central European countries, you know, to raise this with the other governments, I would say that uh, because foreign policy is one of the actually one of the victims of this electoral campaign of of law and justice. Uh, look at the relations with Ukraine. I think the region has a Polish problem now. And I very much hope that if one or other camp wins, we will go beyond this very uh, strange, uh, destructive phase of Polish foreign policy, which was undercutting its own position in the region. Because if I could identify one year ago, an alternative vision for Polish sort of role in this part of Europe as being axis with UK and Ukraine, now look, they destroyed the, even the relationship with Kiev with, with, because they were aiming at the, what, 10% of undecided voters in Poland, which were the only ones which were anti-Ukrainian. So I think Kaczynski knows exactly uh, where maybe the sentiment is, where is the path to attract voters. But then the site, sort of the, dam the, 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 the collateral damage was foreign policy of these elections for the whole country. Thank you. Mom, well, this is all sobering stuff, if I, if I may say that. Um, and yeah, I will, I'm, I'm, there are many things to say about Polish-German relations and the question of re reparations, but I will, I, I'm going to repress them. Uh, we have an online question um, coming from the, the State Department, which is the, the following. Ambassador Fried, and Mr. Esmiller have discussed that Poland needs to give up using its political capital to bash Berlin and fight Brussels, if it is to, pro to provide the sort of leadership on EU-Russia policy that the world needs. Um, I think that's something at this point that we are all agreeing on strongly. But how might energy dynamics, meaning gas pipelines, complicate Polish leadership? And also, is Orban's party allied with any of the Polish parties? Would any of you like to take that? Um, I remember that uh, perhaps a year ago, Jarosław Kaczynski, the leader of the, of the Peace Party, publicly slammed Orban's approach to Russia. And he basically said that whatever ideological sympathies we may have, a split on an issue of such strategic importance is a problem in Polish-Hungarian relations. That was a pretty strong statement. And it was merited. Uh, I was pleased to see it. On the issue of, the question also touched on the issue of energy, which has been a major success of this government. The, under the leadership of Piotr Naimski, they're basically their czar for energy security, Poland was prepared for the Russian gas cutoffs. It was a real success. And it took many years to, to get there. So the, the irony here is that the current Polish government has done a lot of the right things, but some of the more questionable, problematic elements have gotten in the way. And as Milan Nietzsche said, Poland is in danger of punching below its weight in Europe to the detriment of us all. I hope that the next Polish government, whatever its complexion, can fix this because we all need Poland to play this role and Poland intellectually in terms of knowledge about Russia, knowledge about Ukraine is well poised to play it. Um, and this isn't a liberal versus conservative thing. Um, this is a particular feature of the current Polish government that picking fights with Germany that, no, that none of the previous conservative Polish governments did um, has gotten in the way of, of Poland's strategic interests as they define it, which is we've got a Russia problem, the West needs to wake up to it, and uh, here are our recommendations. I mean, they're right about that. And I hope that they're able to um, promote, to direct their political capital so that we all get to that good policy, which was encapsulated by something I've heard in Berlin, which is we must organize European security, not with Russia, but against Russia. That's right. 
That's mm-hmm. something the Poles would have said, but the Germans said it first. And as I've told Poles, this is a great moment. Take this as vindication and then embrace the Germans. And if you don't like their previous approach to Russia, as an American, I can tell you I know all about dumb policies that we have to dig our way out of. But happily, that's another story. I was just going to say, I'm very tempted to just continue this conversation in that vein for another hour, but we can't. Uh, in fact, we only have another 10 minutes. Um, on the energy security point, we haven't really answered that. Do you, any of you think um, that a liberal Polish government uh, would have a more constructive approach on energy security and, and working together with the Germans? I ask because the Green Deal um, and uh, I mean, because co- Poland remains a heavily agricultural uh, uh, country and heavily dependent on the extraction of coal, right? And if I am not completely mistaken, the the insistence in Western European countries, and not just France and Germany, but but countries like Spain and Portugal as well, on moving to renewables is met with very mixed feelings um, in in that are bipartisan in Poland. Would any of you care to comment on that? Am I, is, is that wrong? Yeah, Adam. Well, this is indeed a, a very, very important topic. Uh, and we have done a lot of research on, on people's attitudes towards renewables, towards green transition and, and climate policies. And we see very clearly that the Polish population is very much in favor of going green. Uh, even among conservative voters, uh, there, is, there is a desire to actually, well, speed up the green uh, transition. Uh, people started to identify uh, renewables as a source of uh, security, as hard security as well. Uh, so there has been a major, major switch um, in, uh, in 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 recent years. It has become uh, a topic that is important to to everyone. Basically, uh, of course, the, the conservative government has to deal with uh, with certain segments within the society uh, who still kind of stick want to stick to coal, consider coal being Polish black gold, and and etc. Uh, so it has to move uh, forward a little bit more. Uh, let's let, let's say a little bit slower simply uh rather than than a liberal government so should the government uh, government change and uh i i really would expect um, um speeding up uh, the the green transition in a uh, in a in a more robust way and of course it's also a question of european funds which are currently still being blocked uh, so it's all interconnected uh rule and rule of law and uh, questions of independence of the judiciary and the green transition are so much interconnected and intertwined in in, in Polish politics. Uh, so you can almost you're not able to discuss one without uh, without the other. Uh, so uh, I think uh, with uh, should the liberal opposition or the democratic opposition uh, be uh, be in a position to to form a government, uh, we could actually see a pretty quick and pretty uh, pretty uh, shift transition to to investing more. Uh, in uh, in renewables, simply because uh, of the fact uh, that um, uh, that it's wanted by the public, and that European funds would would would, would be available, and of course there's also a question of uh, of going nuclear in Poland as well, which is also uh, supported by by the public. It's one of the biggest projects uh, uh, run by the by the current government, and it's of course in it's the Polish American project um, uh, as well. Um, but I'm not going to discuss it any farther. So there is uh, there's also kind of a, a consensus within the society that we should go green uh, and go nuclear in, in in sense. Okay. Well, I, I suspect we have, regardless of the outcome uh, of the elections, we're we're we're, we're going to have a lot of um, fights on on these issues uh, in the years to come. But since we are six minutes out from the end of our conversation, I'm I'm going to because I don't want to sort of give you all 30 seconds at the end, I am going to move to last questions, um, weaving in some of the some of the ones that I've, I've gotten online. And I'm going to go in the reverse order. Um, uh, Dan, let me, let me move to you. Um, what advice do you have to American, uh, to, to the Biden administration for uh, making sure that these relationships in, in Central Eastern Europe, um, particularly that between Berlin and Warsaw, don't become even more toxic and derail our transatlantic cooperation on supporting Ukraine? The Biden administration has, has worked with Poland well and successfully. I think they need to 
to work with the new government, whatever it is, and yeah, urge that Poland find a way forward with Germany that advances our shared objective of dealing with Putin's Russia, which is a major, that is Europe's principal security threat. Mm -hmm. Is Putin's Russia, Poland was right, and we need them. And I think that that message may, uh, that message may work. Um, there may be a window after the elections uh, for the polls, not to reverse, if the current government is reelected, they're not going to reverse course, but they could have an inflection point. I think the Biden people do have some, they've earned the, the ability because of the close US-Polish security relationship to urge the Poles to help out and take their place as a major European player. Do you think that the Biden administration ought to suggest uh, that the Poles engage together with say the Germans and the French in European security cooperation more? Would that be a good idea? I think so. Um, the, we didn't discuss the French, but Macron's speech in Bratislava was a very big deal. He basically mm -hmm. apologized for Chirac's having patronized the Central and East Europeans. That's yeah. Ago. Thank you for the reminder. That's that's a really good point. I mean, that but, was right. a that's a big deal. That's yeah. that suggests an opening. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. Dan, I'm going to move to the other ones. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. Milan, uh, do you have a recommendation for Berlin as to what they could do? to improve the relationship with Warsaw? Well, because we seem to be sitting back and saying, you know, this is all Warsaw's fault. And yeah, I'm, I'm not have, sure that's right. You know, what could have they done before the elections? Just uh, staying no, what out could of they it? do now? What could right. they do now? Well, after the election results, they they have to engage in a, in a smart way. By the way, any Polish government will have to move on the nuclear which will be a new rift with uh, with Berlin, mm. because Germany mm. decided sure. to go on uh, non-nuclear. Let me say one more thing about uh, political families. Uh, that was there was a question there. This is a paradox. You 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 call the opposition coalition liberal, but in fact they are center right, and they used to be allies of Viktor Orban in the moderate conservative European People's Party. Thank you. That's an uh, important correction. So you have a fight in Polish elections within the sort of conservative center-right camp more in Slovakia Fico uh, was it's a left with government now he's left left is populist so I think we need to use a different sort of distinction in politics is about those who are sovereigns my country first type uh, of politicians regardless from left or right and more mm -hmm. sort of constructive moderates that could work also with others like liberals um, and uh, I think if if there is if uh, law and justice is re-elected, there will be waiting time for US presidential elections next year and for the European Parliament elections in June the next year that will then constitute new European Commission and new European institution. That's right. And thanks for that reminder as well. Excellent, Milan. Uh, I think a very important point uh, that we need to employ a different taxonomy of uh, positioning political parties. Adam, there's a question online. How much influence are, on the election are we seeing from Russia in regards to social media and disinformation? And this is Joanna Gwozdiowski asking. Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't think that much. Uh, I think this, I wouldn't say that, uh, that of course, this election is completely free um, uh, of, of foreign influence and, and foreign disinformation. Uh, but I don't think this uh, uh, this really would uh, in any in any way um, influence the the election result. Uh, we have other pro problems uh, during the within the within the way how the you know, the campaign is is actually run, and of course the election will be it will be free, but it will it's not fair uh, because the, the whole system is simply uh, tilted towards uh, in favor of the of the of the government, and the government can misuse public funds to to finance its uh, its its campaign. So there are other more important issues um, uh, on the domestic front uh, that could uh, that could uh, cause a different outcome of the uh, of the election uh, rather than uh, foreign influence in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Anna, you you get the last word. Um, what hope? What hope is there for for Ukraine 
in in the in all the contexts that that we have just talked about. The Poles are staunch are, are both staunch supporters of Ukraine and very worried about the impact of Ukrainian accession to the EU and what that would mean, among other things, for the agricultural budget, for EU funding. And they are not the only ones in Central Eastern Europe um, who who have reason to worry because they would become net um, payers rather than net receivers of European funding. How how do we how do we preserve that cohesion in Europe under these circumstances? And what will what should Western Europeans, what could America do to mitigate the, the inevitable tensions arising from this enlargement of Europe? Um, I think the first thing America can do is not elect Trump in 2024, because that will be more decisive for Ukraine than anything else that happens. Fair um, enough. And I think secondly, that's what negotiations are all about. And if governments enter into actual negotiations as opposed to grandstanding, then there are ways of reassuring uh, Poland and the other current net beneficiaries in ways that make this much more palatable. Thank you very much. And thank you for also for being so, so brief and, and pithy with that last, last answer. Let me, let me end by saying that um, as some of you know, I have enemies on my brains currently. I, I just wrote an essay on, on the conceptualization of the West as an enemy by, by Putin. But I've, I've also noticed that this expression is creeping into European discourse. Um, the German conservatives have been describing the Greens as enemies, which is bizarre given that the actual enemies of, of representative constitutional order and representative democracy in Germany uh, are not the Greens, but a certain alternative for Germany. And it is equally disturbing to see the, the, the peace government describing Germans as enemies at a time when we are deeply intertwined with each other, our societies are cordial with each other, and we should be working together towards higher ends. And so um, it seems to me one of the lessons of this period is not to stare at the wrong, not to stare at the wrong ed enemy. Right, and to get it together, folks. Thank you so much, Anna Jumara Busse, Dan Fried, Milan Nitsch, and Adam Tracek from Stanford, from Washington, from Berlin, and from Warsaw for joining us for this fascinating discussion on the outcome of the Polish elections. Stay tuned for the results on September um, on, on Sunday, October 15th, and I'm sure there will be more to discuss afterwards. Thank you for joining us all. And please um, stay tuned, but mute your, keep your microphones muted as the final credits roll. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for every, to everyone who joined us online.